Since the dawn of time, man has been curious. And for almost as long, the Vibes Broadcast Network has sought the truth. Investigate. Discuss. Explore. Okay. Maybe in other episodes, but this one is just... Listen to the Vibes. The views and opinions of our guests may not necessarily reflect those of the host or the Vibes Broadcast Network. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. I have here Mr. Michael Stein. We're going to get to know him today and have a nice conversation. Uh, He's also uh, in the Austin area, as I am. And uh, we found each other on a little website called Matchmaker. Now, don't get the wrong idea because it's Mm. not a a dating site. (laughs) But, uh, you know, gets people together that do podcasts and uh, it's been a really nice little community. I've met some wonderful people, made some great friends. And uh, anyway, we're going to kick this off. You tell us a little bit about you, sir. Uh, okay. My name is Michael Stein. I do a podcast. That's how we made it. I do a podcast called Long Shot Leaders. And uh, basically, we tell the stories of underground, uh, underdog, you know, stories, people that have overcome large obstacles that find success. Uh, I do it because I kind of consider myself an underdog. My story is that my grandmother escaped the Russian concentration camps on her way to America. My dad was a New York homeless street kid only to make millions of dollars and then become homeless again. And I was an unplanned child born two months premature, ADD, ADHD, and dyslexia and health issues and really never had any success as a kid, all kinds of problems. Uh, I was put in a special needs school and the uh, only success I had was making people laugh at me. And then uh, one day, like most American kids, I saw the movie Rocky when I was 10 years old, 11 years old. And I said, well, here's a guy like me, right? Here's a guy. It's like, you know, he's not successful, but he keeps on trying and he's funny. But the only difference between Rocky and myself is he's physically fit. So I made it my cause celeb after that to become physically fit and work out every day. And uh, shortly after, within five short years, I became a physical fitness trainer. So that was a big jump for me. And I figured, you know what? This is like a muscle. Anything that, you know, success is like a muscle. So I told my, uh, I wanted to be like my dad. I wanted to be an entrepreneur, an actor, and a comedian. Uh, He was just an entrepreneur. And I told my high school tutor that. And she said, well, you might want to work with your hands because not everybody's meant to do what they want to do. And I said, well, screw you. And I went off to do a business. And I failed two days later. And I said, maybe she's right. Maybe, you know, I've seen this ebb and flow of failure and success, kind of like my dad. I was like, wow, shit. And then about six months later, I decided to do stand-up comedy and I did really well, packed the house. I said, well, you know, I, I, there's no money, you know, in packing the house in this comedy place. But I said, you know, if I could do this in LA, you know, where I was born and raised. And I said, you know, I could, I could bring people, you know, to nightclubs, which is really big back in the late eighties. And I decided to become a nightclub promoter and became the number one nightclub promoter in my age bracket in Los Angeles and uh, went on to do big promotional, you know, movie premieres and, and from then, I was able to be, you know, become an actor by meeting so many people. My first acting role was playing Dirt Diggler in the Dirt Diggler story, which eventually became Boogie Nights, which I appear in as well. And I went off to become a filmmaker, uh, segueing from nightclubs, and uh, had much success in that, uh, winning film festival awards, getting my films bought by HBO, and almost a movie deal. But after not have after you know five years of you know being a, a filmmaker and production assistant and development hell, no movie deal. I was broke after being a wealthy kid, you know, with my nightclub business. Now I'm broke again. And I said, you know, screw Hollywood. I'm gonna make my own movie. But the only thing I was broken in debt. So I decided I'm going to start a business and I started the business I'm in now. And I, within six months, I made a half million dollars and I was able to make a movie called Love Hollywood Style with Faye Dunaway, Andy Dick, and Coolio. Found myself uh, right directing and producing and acting across a two-time Academy Award winner. And I said, you know, I, I did this because I you know, as an entrepreneur, I was able to see this ebb and flow of failure and success. And I, ever since that, that company, although I almost bonded them out making that movie, uh, that company has made over a hundred million dollars. And I still wow. have that company today. And I said, if I'm ever going to do a podcast, it's going to be about people that have overcome large obstacles and find success, something that accentuates who I am and what I've done and what I do now. And that's why I do a podcast called Long Shot Leaders. And that's why I'm here talking to you today. I've got a question for you, yes, sir. Because um, 
I heard something you said that is kind of a common thing between us of when you tell people that you want to do something in life. I mean, that's like your dream and they, they kind of discourage you in a way and say, yeah, you need to do something else because that's probably not going to work out. Why do, why do you think people do that? Well, I think that, you know, they do, you know, people do things for six reasons, right? I got heavily involved in personal development. So I kind of, I'll slide into some personal development, you know, jargon here. When I was, uh, you know, when I started promoting nightclubs, that's when I got into uh, personal development, oddly enough. <laughs> you think like when people are drinking and doing cocaine, like, why did you get, I never did any of that stuff. I got in develop, personal development, but people do things mainly for six re reasons. If you believe in six human need psychology, they either do it for significance or certainty or variety or love connection or growth, you know? So she might've been sincere. She seemed sincere. She might've been sincere and said, look, I'm just trying to contribute to this kid and, you know, try to protect him away from heartache or, you know, I doubt it, but she might've had a sense of significance saying, well, who are you? I'm a school teacher. She was a school teacher. And who are you? You're barely you're going to graduate high school. Who are you going to become an entrepreneur? You know, why you can't do that. You know, I don't know whether I bruised her significance or, you know, kind of, you know, she was just trying to really, you know, contribute to me, you know, but uh, people do it for those reasons. And um, I think her heart was in the right place because she seemed like a nice lady, but I was pissed off when she said it. And that's why people do sometimes some people, those people are vindictive. There are vindictive people to say, well, it makes them their, their modus operandi as they feel bad when you feel like you're going to say you're going to do something because it makes them feel inadequate rather than another person might use that vehicle for saying, well, that inspires me to hear somebody else say that. It all depends on our mindset and what our belief systems are. Well, um, for some people, it's a big discouragement and they kind of give up on their dreams. And for others, I think it's just a way of saying, hey, I'm going to prove you wrong just to go out and, and do what you really want to do. I mean, for myself, I always wanted to be an artist. My, my first dream was that I wanted to make album covers. Mm -hmm. And um, the, my second dream was I wanted to be a comic book artist. And I kept hearing the same old, you know, oh, it's, it's going to be too difficult. And, you, you know, there's too much competition. You probably aren't going to make it. So I gave up on it. And before I knew it, I mean, I was working those labor jobs and you know anything to make ends meet and it took me 47 48 years and a um, a disability for me to actually try to pursue something I wanted to do I kept hearing this the same old you know you're not going to make it or that's the, a bad idea I mean even moving up here to Austin I would tell family members, hey, I want to move up to the Austin area because I've lived around Houston all my life. Yeah. And uh, like, no, it's too expensive and you're not going to like it. And I've, I'm sorry, but I fell in love with this place. Um, the artist in you. Yeah. And it's basically, the, it's about the same as living down there. It's not that much more expensive. In fact, there's a lot of things cheaper here than they are in the Houston area. Right. I mean, granted, I'm not an artist, but I found something that I wanted to do, and I said, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Well, living out here, as far as living out here is concerned, I mean, uh, I, I love it out here. I'm, I'm in Georgetown, which is uh, Georgetown, Texas, is just outside of Austin, just north. And, uh, you know, coming from L.A., it's like Monopoly money, you know. But uh, things do get expensive in time, you know, and, and this area is growing, so I see why people might say that it's getting expensive, especially now. Um, but uh, people will say things because, you know, they, you know, I talk to my daughters all the time. It's like, why, why did they do that? Why did they do that? So look, people are, we're all built the same, but you know, it's we, how we get to our emotional, you know, destinations sometimes are different. Right? right. So people have different vehicles on how to make themselves feel the way they need to feel. So say, so who are you to go to Austin? Who are you? Who do you think you are? You rock and roll. You're an artist, you know? You know, it's like, yeah, man, I'm, I am whoever I want to be. And you could be, you know, people can, they just, they just need to get the reps in on feeling good about other people succeeding rather than that knee jerk reaction of putting them in a band -a loop state of constantly look at somebody else and saying, well, that equates me not doing something. That doesn't equate that. So that's why people do what they do sometimes. I've encouraged people just to 
pursue your dreams. I mean, even if it doesn't work out, at least you can say you try. And even if you fail the first time, keep trying. You never know. Something could click. Right. right. And I get it that people like if you got if you got a friend, a best friend, and you're both trying to do the same thing and you're both kind of at the same level when you start and he just totally exceeds you and he's he's a multi-billionaire and you're still struggling and he's exceeding at what you wanted to. I get that. But then again, you know, what difference does it make? You know, it's like you, you have to find meaning because because the, the, these emotions, you, you need to set an environment for you to succeed as well. Mm -hmm. And if you have resentment, that's not a that's not a recipe for someone that's going to achieve success. That's a that's a counterproductive, uh, you know, element in your recipe. Most most self-made billionaires, self-made people have a key component that I've noticed since interviewing all these people. That's gratitude. Mm. The gratitude is the chicken and the egg and then the egg comes first. Right. So the gratitude comes first. And usually success comes after people that they find that equilibrium of gratitude. Yeah, my a reoccurring theme is always gratitude will change your attitude. <laughs> right. That's nice. I like that. Well, you have so many people that get kind of down and out or they're down on themselves and they're always looking at, oh, I don't have this. I don't have that. And it's like, well, look at the things you do have. Mm hmm. And show a little appreciation. I mean, whether you believe in God, the, the universe, the higher power, whatever it is, if you show that you are thankful for what you have, that opens the door for more things to come into your life. Yeah. And the energy it takes to feel those things is, is exa exhausting. It takes a lot less energy to once you become conscious competent or unconscious competence, you're just rolling with it. But, you know, it takes less energy to you know focus on what is going to enable you for happiness as opposed to what you don't have and that's a lot it's a lot of it takes a lot of energy and something else that i've noticed is that you know number one my my circle of friends have gotten a lot smaller mm -hmm. and reason being is that I, I i spent so much of my my life being an alcoholic and drug addict and mm -hmm. I had to get away from that. And so my friends that are still doing that, I, I love them from afar, but I can't hang out with them anymore. Right. And I put myself um, with people that are successful, that are, you know, have gotten their lives straightened out, walking the, the, I guess you say the straight and narrow. Right. And amongst those people that I am affiliating myself with, they with their success, they have taught me too. you have to give, you have to give back. You, you, um, you give things away basically. And I'm like, well, you know, what are you talking about? Am I supposed to just pack up all my stuff and give it away? It's not necessarily that mm -hmm. it's like, um, my, I have a friend of mine who's an architect and he got on a website that, um, you you just offer your services up on there for free. And so he put on there, I will make plans for you at no charge. And some, somebody had gotten a hold of that and was just wanted to see what he had. The next thing you know, he's got a multi-million dollar contract making designs for buildings and things. Mm. He says, just when you do things like that, you, you open up other doors and people get to see what you're made of. So, you know, how, how do you feel about that? Well, I think that there's something to be said, you know, it's like a Gary Vaynerchuk thing. Anybody who knows who Gary Vaynerchuk is, he wrote a book called uh, Jab, Jab, Right Cross or Jab, Jab, Cross. Basically, you know, you, you give somebody, you know, you give and you give and maybe that, you know, maybe, you know, three out of uh, one out of three or one out of four, you do a ask. You know, there's a psychology to that, but it depends on, you know, I like to keep, get more of like a simple holistic look at it. It's like, look, you know, what do you want your life to look like? And who do you want to be? Do you want to be somebody that feels like there's a life of scarcity? Because when you feel like there's a life of scarcity, then you're constantly asking, asking, asking. Because if you give something, information, a phone number away to somebody, you feel like they're, oh, now I'm not going to have that. And that's going to get diluted or this or that. Hollywood's very much like that. It's like, oh, you, you, I got an A-list friend and now I'm going to give his information to you. And then I'm going to get diluted out of that, that friendship. And you live a life of scarcity. 
And I notice more often than not that 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 doesn't help you to succeed. You know, you live a life of, you know, uh, generosity and, and uh, you don't give anything away. You have to be generous to yourself too, right? Which means you got to hold on to what you have. But, you, you know, giving, um, and it's part of a human need that we talked about in the beginning, right? Contribution, you know? And uh, it's, a, it's a healthy connection. So, you know, that's how I feel about that. I feel like, you know, to, for me, it depends on the person. But for me, I like to try to give, you know, 90% of the time. And um, usually I find that I, if I feel like there's a life of abundance, once again, I'm performing so well, my, my asks from other people are very limited because I feel like there's a life of abundance. I have gratitude and I mostly everything that I get is coming to me because I'm working hard for it and I'm enjoying life. And, you know, usually people could sense that subconsciously. They, they don't know. They'll look at that person. My daughters go to, you know, they have, they have a life of privilege and sometimes they'll go and say, I'm not pretty as other girls. Oh, I'm not. There's a, why do the guys want to date me? You know, 15 and a half year old, right? I said, look, probably because you just said that. You know, if you're going to wear that, that's going to show up on your, you got like a hundred, hundreds of muscles in your face, in your face, you know, just a slight muscle contortion in the wrong direction, you know, internally sends off messages to other people subconsciously, it just science, you know, so, you know, just don't permeate that out outward, you know, really try to work on yourself inside and it changes things on the outside, just not physically or appearance wise, but also everything else that you do. Well, I'm such a big believer in karma as well. And I've had people through the years that have helped me when I've been in dire straits and I, I think it's only right. I need to do the same thing. And I mean, granted, I, my platform isn't as big as other people, but I, I always offer up if, if you need to get on and maybe promote something that you're doing or whatever, you're always welcome to come back to my show. Just give me a message. We'll set it up. Right. And to see somebody that has been on my show that has gone that next level and gotten a little bit more successful. I mean, okay. Whether I had something to do with it or not, that doesn't matter. Even if I just gave you a little bit of extra confidence, anything it it brings me joy to know that, that you're succeeding. That's been the whole goal of the shows. I want to see people be more successful or for somebody who's listening or watching our videos, if you see somebody on here and you get that message that just clicks in your brain, then that I've achieved something. Yeah, that's wonderful because you've created, that's the meaning that you've given it. That's, a, that's what I would call an empowering meaning, you know, as to where other people have somewhere along the way, they have adopted a meaning uh, that this A plus B equals, you know, this, and it's a negative, you know, feeling that they'll have towards, well, if he's getting something, I'm not getting something, you know? So that's, that's what happens to people. They get the, you know, and sometimes they'll, you could even tell them that, you know, but they've been doing it for so long. They have to get out of that pattern, you know? And once they, you know, it's a, it's a muscle, you know, and I understand, you know, the two best friends, you know, doing the same thing. And like we talked about, right. but after a while, you know, it, it becomes, you know, second nature and that, you know, that's what you want to work towards. If you, if you value higher consciousness, you know, in life, try to strive for you know that that emotional feeling that 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 understanding of life then that's what you want to work towards you know outside being outside yourself well and i'm pretty sure you've noticed in the world of youtube the the videos that get the most views and the ones that you know get the most subscribers and all that they they uh they get those clickbait kind of videos and they're always talking negativity you know, there's always seems to be some kind of controversy or something behind what they're doing. Hey, I, I get it. You do you if if that's the way you want to make your money. But in a in a world like that, what makes someone like you not go that route and want to do something more positive? Well, um, those people do well. It, it's an interesting observation. You know, I, everything to me is what can I learn from this and, you know, in our today, a society, you, we are fast tracking, you know, psychology and human needs and why people do what they do so fast. Right. So you can go on a YouTube and say, like, well, why, why is that? That guy's a dick. You know, why is his video doing so well? Well, he's offering something where there's a niche, you know, people are going there and he's, he's offering sensationalism. Let's say somebody's doing something outrageous and people 
have a need back to six human needs you know people have a need for variety that's a big human need you know and they you know you just did, if i told you hey kyle you're going to eat the same thing every day you're going to do the same thing every day and i'm going to tell you what you can do every day and, you know and even even you'd be get you get tired and say look you're going to make love the same great woman every day, but it's going to be the same thing same way same way. You'd, after a while I'd be like well i want something a little different you know <laughs> like that twilight zone uh, episode so so the you know they're offering something that's different you know, and, or somebody might be offering, you know, something that's educational or somebody might be offering something that, you know, there's, that meets a need, you know, or they're, they're like my, you know, they're offering something that's politically um, lined up to what that person wants, you know, so that's a bidding a need. So they get connection through what that person's posting it. How do I feel about, you know, look, I, I'm a, I, I think it's a, it, People could do whatever they want to do. You know, I, I, I'm painting a canvas and everybody has to paint their own canvas on how they want their life to live out. You know, I don't, I don't shun the guy, or, um, you know, that, uh, who's the brothers, uh, I forgot, I forgot the brothers that just did the boxing match, uh, Jake Paul and, oh, and yeah. guys, I don't, I don't fault those guys, you know, they're, they're just doing what they can and, uh, you know, but not my style. My, my thing is, you know, I'm, I'm an ex comedian. They're a comedian still doing stand up at the end of the year again. You know, I try to offer something that's funny. Not here today. I'm, I'm a serious guy. Or personal development. I'll do something on personal development. Anything that is you, I believe you should do whatever is you organically. I, that's my knee jerk reaction towards doing these things, uh, you know, on video. Just try to be yourself. And um, I don't have, I have high standards, but I don't have a lot of rules on how other people should live their life. Right. I, you know, but I have high standards on how I live mine, but I don't, I don't create a lot of roadblocks. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't fault them whatsoever. You know, right. that's the thing you like to do. I say, go for it. I mean, and I enjoy watching some of those videos too. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> right. I, I don't want to take that route myself, even if I don't end up with the, you know, a million subscribers. Uh, the, the thing that I'm trying to put out in the world is something I, I guess I felt like I wished I had gotten more of when I was coming up. You know, I need some positivity. I need somebody to inspire me and maybe motivate me to do those things that I really want to do in life. And, and so I didn't, I didn't take that route of, Oh, you know, what, what controversial thing can we talk about today? Or, you know, right. Or, or some of those people that sit there and, and they just, like you seen the ones where they just stuff themselves with all kinds of crappy food and it's just i don't know <laughs> I, i'm i'm not that kind of person yeah no i like to each its own i get it you know there's people out there that say look this is my life and this is what truly interests me so i want to watch the guy that does all you can eat doritos that that that's fascinating to me i'm like that's cool you know if that's what turns you on and makes you happy life is only as good as the emotions lived within that life so you might as well fill it with emotions that you've associated Although I will say that I live by a, um, none of the stuff that I'm preaching today is an exact science. It's almost a perfect art form on how the human brain works, but it's not exact science. But I will say that there's something that I always try to guide myself from my goals. And that's called the triad of a good decision, which is if it's good for me and it's good for you and it's good for the greater good, then I, that's the kind of decision I will usually take. The tough decisions uh, that are the ones that world leaders have to do because they'll say, well, it's good for me and it's good for you. Is it really good for the greater good? It's greater good for our country, but what about the other guys? So those are the tough hierarchy decisions that I don't envy, but I usually try to, you know, have a triad of a good decision working on full cylinders when I, you know, whatever I do, especially when it's public. I, I need to learn how to play video games. My grandkids will sit there and watch hours and hours of videos of other people watching video games. <laughs> I haven't quite understood that one yet, but <laughs> whatever. Oh, yeah, my, your boat. <laughs> right. my little one's trying to get me in Minecraft. She built me a whole house and we're in a world and all this. I'm like, that's fascinating. I was like, I guess, uh, you know, I'm kind of busy, but you know, if that's what you want, I don't want to get addicted to this stuff though. So I got to be careful, you know? <laughs> I, I suck at video games. I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> I, I mean, the last video game I was really into, I think was Pac-Man or Centipede. So that kind of tells you how old I am. <laughs> you know, they did a study on that though. It's not like older people, you know, that as opposed to an eight year old doesn't have the cognitive ability to learn a video game. What it is, they just have time plus effort mm -hmm. and 
they have more time to learn that skill set as to where tell you what, you know, there's no difference between the application of you learn on the podcast, which you're, you're getting really in synced into now as to where, you know, playing a video game, just you, your just time and interest is in a different place. This is true. I'm, I'm just not, I'm not that big into video games. I, I never really was, even when they were popular when I was a kid. I mean, yeah, I played them every once in a while, but I was more of that kid that, you know, wanted to ride his bike around the neighborhood and right. go, meet up with the guys in the empty field to play football or baseball or something. And, totally. Likewise, likewise, actually, but we're the same generation, I think. So you, we grew up on that before that all they had when we were kids, when we were like six, five, five years old, all they had was pong. <laughs> right. Remember that game. That was high. That was, that was the shit. I was like, wow, look at that. Oh, that was so, I, I, you look back and you think uh, all it is, is this little, square yeah. going up and down knocking yeah. a little dot back across the screen and we thought that was the most amazing thing in the world how in the world do they get that to do that that's right and now it's almost like you're watching a movie that's right that's right and we turned that thing with knobs that that little paddle that you had to catch that that little electronic ball with on pong with you had to turn knobs to like get the thing moving up and down now you you know we're not far away from actually um having uh glasses that'll have our eyes um you know do the uh, mouse movement for us well there's so many different applications you could do with stuff like that you know uh they train military people with stuff like that just imagine i mean like in healthcare, they help you to number one maybe redevelop your brain or or even help in in uh physical rehab so there's definite pluses to it i i'm not putting any of that down whatsoever i think it's ingenious and oh, yeah you know I, I have a grandson who's six years old and he has autism mm. and he gets into those games and it's like his his focus has changed and it helps to kind of calm him down and yeah. it, it it's wonders you know to, i i get that because like i said i got the adhd you know as an adult you know and i and, you know, it's not an exact science either, right? Mm -hmm. But I will tell you know all the all the components that they say is of an ADHD person. I am highly uh, on that. But uh, when I do, I get hyper focus on things, and uh, tunnel. You know, the tunnel will close in, and that's the only thing. So that's why, I like, I became really good at backgammon. You know, my early thirties, like I started playing backgammon. I became very good at it. I guess a you know a person with hyper focus does well at that game. And uh, started competing with people, you know, online like, around the world, you know, doing really well. And I was like, holy shit, I just spent three and a half hours. And I was like, I got other things and other goals. And this is not, you know, I don't want to become the number one backgammon player in the world. So I had to curb that. And that's why I told my daughter, I said, I'll do this, but I got to be careful. I don't want to get, I don't want to get, I don't want to fall in love with Minecraft, you know, to where it's going to take my time away from other goals that I have. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Now, we were talking about disabilities and things like that, and um, I know that's sometimes a hindrance for people, but it doesn't have to be a complete, uh, you know, blockade to keep you from becoming successful. Uh, when you come across people that maybe have the same kind of problems that you do, or say like me, what are the, the things that you I guess, encourage them to do in order to get past those things and to not focus on that, but focus on your goal? Well, the first thing I, you know, you know, like tell somebody to do, you know, I would tell anybody whether they have something or not, they got an issue. I was like, well, first of all, kind of clear your head for the environment to like, you know, make a good decision. And that is the triad of emotions, which is, you know, your physiology, your focus and your words. So, you know, if you're really at a, at a down state, anybody that's listening is really, they're at a pit. The first thing you have to do it irreverently, because I know you can't do it, it just doesn't happen. Irreverent, irreverently means you have to force it. So you have to change your body. So there, there's an, a recipe towards putting yourself in a positive state. And that recipe is Deep breathing as opposed to shallow breathing. Shallow breathing is a recipe for, you know, somebody that's crestfallen or sad, you know, deep breathing is somebody that's feeling powerful, you know, stand up straight, get your chin up, you know, you know, kind of like, you know, start to, and immediately start to focus on 
where you want to go and not where you don't want to go. So where you want to go is like, you, this is ideally, you know, if, if, if Mary out there said, well, I wanted this, but this is happening. Well, you already focused on it enough. Chances are, you know, we focus like, you know, last night, you focus 90% on the shit that was going on with you that you hated. Now it's time to like, you know, focus 99% on where you want to go. So change your physiology, change your focus, then mind your words that you're saying to yourself and others. Mind, make your words being empowering questions. So they say, you know, when something happens to you, it's like, holy shit, I'm in a car accident. I'm, I'm going to miss the, the party. And that person was there. It's going to screw up the whole thing. It's like, it's like, all right, you, you already acknowledge that for the first, you know, for five minutes. You know, now you got to say, what can I learn from this? What, what's interesting about this? What can I gain out of this? What's funny about the, you just, those are empowering questions that you'll come up with empowering answers that will lead you in a direction. So that would be the first thing I'd say, look, you got to change your triad of emotions. Once you get there, then you could start to think about what do you want in your life? You know, now that you're at least in your peak state, you got to change your state first. That's what I tell people, you know, it's, you know, it's like count your blessings look because once you count your blessings and you start to do a, what you called an acting called the Superman exercise where you're like, count your blessings. Look this way. I have done this. I have done that. I have done that. Now you're in a place where you feel like they're, not only things are possible, but they could be probable because you added up everything that you're good at. So then I would start to talk about their goals, you know, fast tracking to like, you know, a long conversation that I would have with somebody. If they were trying to go for a goal, I'd say, all right, first thing we need to do is make it a smart goal, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time bound. I said, but we got to get a date, a deadline date, realistic date that is attainable for you that you're going to make this goal happen. Oh, and whatever that goal is, trying to get over something, trying to like make sure it's like, I don't want, want people don't want to be friends with me or whatever it is. It could be anything. You know, you want more friends? Well, there's, there's a methodology to it. You know, model yourself after the greatest people have done that. But there's a whole, I would just kind of take them on a journey like that. And it sounds exhausting, <laughs> but tying a shoe is exhausting when you have unconscious incompetence. You don't even know what a tying a shoe is. And then you, then you got your tongue out and you learn how to tie it and then it becomes conscious competence. And eventually you do it enough. It's unconscious competence and you're on your way to the races. That's true. You know, something that I've noticed with the, everyone that I've talked to breathing always comes up mm -hmm. and because I I'd asked somebody, because they told me about meditation and, you know, I've always heard about meditation. I always thought that you, you, you know, you sat in the middle of the room doing the home and all that kind of stuff. So breathe. And uh, I think one of them, and this is how I do my meditation now, is that you you breathe in all that positivity that you can think of. And then when you exhale, you dispose of all the negativity that you possibly can. And you know, for health reasons, deep breathing, and it, it's just that, that that keeps coming up. So there's got to be some validity to that. Well, yeah, when you, when you breathe, especially when you want, you want to have oxygen going through your nasal passages and deep down in your lungs, and that's replacing the, you know, the cells with the new oxygen cells and oxygenating is going to boost up your dopamine. And it's also going to get yourself alkaline as opposed to acidic, because when you're acidic, you're, you have a low, you know, you have a low pH, now, not to be technical about all this, but this is, you know, technically, you know, what happens on that level. But it also changed, you know, the phys changing your physiology is step one in that triad we talked about, you know, and that'll help you give an environment to where you can start to at least open up to where you can come up with solutions to, for the verbal and the focusing. So, yeah, I mean, breathing is number one. Let's say you're a quadriplegic and you want to be able to get in peak state for, you know, and you're going to speak to an audience, which I've talked to somebody as a paraplegic and he talks about breathing all the time. You know, you can't go do jumping jacks, you know. Of which, if you're a stand-up comedian or a podcaster, I suggest before you do your podcast, do some jumping jacks. It'll boost up your dopamine. You know, your brain will be working better. You'll be more in a positive energy. I get it. You know, but it's all, it's, you know, just how the body works. And that breathing starts number one, you know, and getting, getting oxygen in there. Well, in that time that you sit and you think about things, that's something else. I thought you had to clear your mind of all things. Like, no, this is the time that you actually kind of have a conversation with yourself and and discuss what are the things that I need to do to, you know, to achieve my goals. I mean, it, I, I totally get it. Those times alone when I can just sit and be lost in my thoughts and kind right. of focus, it, it makes such a difference. 
So yeah. Um, Meditation's I, awesome. That's a whole other, that's a whole other thing. Cause then you are doing all the things we kind of talked about, but then you're also just trying to slow things down so you can simplify your thoughts and take a very calm inventory of what's happening. And then really just kind of, you know, cause you have so much sense. You could breathe and you could do everything I just talked about, but if you're trying to, you know, kind of change your state and do something a little different, kind of, it's important to get to neutral. Right. <laughs> right. You know, you could do everything I just said, but then if you're constantly moving and, a, and I tend to do that too, but sometimes you just need to calm down and then practice doing nothing. So your brain can come up with other possibilities that you're not, you know, you want to, you know, you know, sometimes they tell you to, as a, as a dementia person that has, their parents might have dementia, say, look, put your underwear on with the opposite leg sometimes, <laughs> or do something different that you normally don't do to change the mind. Well, if meditation comes in play because we're all moving so fast, especially here in America, you know, that we need to slow down so you can do something that you normally don't do and kind of clear your mind, have other possibilities. True. Well, also, when I do daily affirmations, that, that's along the lines of my, my meditation. Um, and one of the other things that I've tried to encourage folks to do is when you have goals in mind is to, to make a vision board. Mm. So, you know, if you, if you want to be that guy that owns a nice car, a nice house or whatever the possibilities are, get that vision board and put it up there. Well, I was talking to a guy the other day about that. And he says, well, I like to do something that I call the reverse bucket list. He says, um, put up there the things that you've already accomplished and look at all those things that you've done. I was like, you know what? I never thought about doing it that way. Always looking to what I can be doing, what, what I have accomplished. And it kind of gives you extra uh, confidence. You know what I Absolutely. mean? Absolutely. There's so many dynamics to that. You know, one wonderful thing about that is if you really start to identify with all your great accomplishments, and you, you so not saying that don't, don't identify your failures you, know, you own up to those two and really take pride in, you know, saying what those failures are. That's what I've learned to done, you know, with, do with uh, the podcast. But, you know, when you own all those successes and you really have them in a co your cognitive, the inventory of that, um, it, it sets, you know, your, your trajectory to where you're like, you, you believe your, your life is probable in that direction. And also if you start to, it's harder to have a non-belief that you're successful when you add those up because your brain doesn't want to go through cognitive dissident, right? You know, which is meaning, you know, I'm healthy, but I'm also a smoker. You know, that's cognitive dissident. You, when you add up that vision board of all those successes, and then you say, well, this is who I am. And then when something comes along your pathway of life, and then it, it contradicts that, that vision board of all those successes, you say, well, I can't do that. Cause that would give me some constantly your brain saying that's, that would, I would cause cognitive dissident that, and that, that enables you, it reinforces that part of your, your brain as well. I tell you, you, you look back in all those things that you have accomplished in life. And let's take, for example, two years ago, I was having to use a wheelchair and a cane oh. and, and now I can walk around the block without needing it. Okay. I, I still have some other things that I have to overcome. I was telling you about the, you know, the pain that I still go through and I've had to have a nerve stimulator put in, but look how far I have come from two years ago when I couldn't do any of these things. Right. And it gives me that confidence to keep moving forward. So I encourage anybody out there, look at the things that you have accomplished in your life. And if you have made mistakes, yes, like you said, you acknowledge that. Once you've acknowledged that, move on from it. Don't, don't dwell on those things. Right. Absolutely. And there's a healthy way to look at your mistakes. You know, some people will say, well, I'm going to display my mistakes to, so you could all feel sorry for me to gain connection. Well, that's one thing. But then you, if you look at your mistakes and say, look, I'm going to, when you, you know, it's kind of like comedy, right? When you write jokes, you, you know, you want to write down all the bad ones so you could clear your mind for the good ones right? And write them down, get them out of the way. So though your failures, accept them, bring them out there, write them out again, write them down, get them out of the way, you know? So then you can, you know, say, look, I have nothing to hide. You know, it's a lot harder to keep secrets and, you know, you don't have to tell us the world, but to yourself, you know, don't keep a secret from yourself. It's, it takes a lot of energy. Right. 
And for heaven's sakes, when you're trying to do something, the best thing to do is just start. You know, right. you're going to make mistakes along the way. I look back at some of my older videos and like, oh my God, I was awful back then, <laughs> but look how far I've come. You know, right. I used to be that guy that I wrote down every question before our, my interviews. And then I realized I was focusing in on all those questions I just wrote down. I wasn't listening to the person that I was talking to. So they probably already answered one of my questions before I even asked it, but yet I was waiting for that pause so I could get in there and ask the next question. Right. Miss out. And I learned, Hey, just pay attention to the conversation. You can, you can come up with a, a lot off the top of your head and it's, it's worked wonders. So get out there. I mean, make the mistakes. You, you need to make those mistakes so you can grow and move on from it. Right. I, yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, I guess I, I was inherently fast tracked on that because when you're a stand up comedian, which I've done since I'm 19, you, you, the report, the most important thing is a rapport with the audience, you know? So if you're so concerned about your material, you're, it's counterproductive because mm -hmm. that your, your material is important. <laughs> Otherwise you have nothing to talk about, <laughs> but you want to set that, learn it, set it and forget it. Cause the most important thing is talking in podcasts as well, or acting or anything talking to the person, really having that human experience, taking turns, talking, listening to them, really kind of getting selflessly involved in what they're talking about. Cause that, that, that band loop is what we're here for on planet earth or what really satisfies people, people listening as well. Um, I got another question for you uh, along the lines of doing podcasting. I'm, I'm very transparent when I do my shows, <clears throat> I don't hold back anything, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, main reason I, if there's somebody out there that can, I guess, identify with the things that I've gone through and say, Hey, I've been through that too. I'm glad somebody is sharing that. What, what's your thoughts on transparency as far as the host goes? Well, you know, I, once again, teach its own, you know, I mean, there's some shows out there that they're, you know, they don't talk about their personal life at all, or they're very careful, but they have great content. They'll be doing, a, I don't know, any kind of like show about medical stuff or political stuff or sports, you know, and, and they're just fantastic. You know, I only know how to do things or I'm, I'd say I'm best at just being an open vessel without uh, any kind of sensor. You know, I, that's why I do a, a podcast without where it is explicit because I, I'll say, I might say the wrong thing. I don't normally swear all the time, but, or whatever, but my, I'm a, I have a stream of consciousness to where if somebody asks me, you know, something personal about myself, my knee jerk reaction is just blurt it out and tell them. And, um, and I'll also might blurt out something, you know, to ask, you know, so I just, I, I only know one way. It's a stream of consciousness of just being an open vessel. That's my style as to where other people, you know, I, that's cool. You know, I mean, there's guys out there that talk sports and they don't, they're just very calculated with their questions and they're great, you know? So I don't have a, in a, opinion i have my own opinion on what i do and that's it you know if you listen to my podcast it's just gonna be like well i guess you know and i'll i might say something inappropriate i'm like you know and just let people know right away Oop, well sorry about that you know <laughs> yeah it's so kind of glad that i uh pre-record everything because if i if i say something really out of line <laughs> i have to censor myself but for the most part uh, what you see is what you get right Right. I've never taken anything out unless somebody told me to. And I, I just let the cards lie where they are, you know, and say, look, this is the conversation I had with this person. And, um, you know, sometimes things sound bad or silly or fucked up or whatever. You know, I'm like, okay, well, that's just the way it is. You know, I, that's the life that I chose to live, you know, so I don't care. Well, I have noticed that you've had quite a, a, a few big names on your show. Um, what's that been like? That's great. You know, knock on wood, you know, my life, you know, through, um, you know, stand up comedy and being a nightclub promoter for so many years and acting and filmmaking and, you know, knock on wood, I'm able to kind of, kind of grab on some people. I don't have huge stars yet. I got a couple in the works, uh, but um, I've had, you know, and then there's also the people that I really just care about stars as far as high profile, the people that really interest me. One of my most interesting interviews is a guy named Ben Lesser, who was in the Holocaust, 92 year old Ben Lesser author. And he's not a huge star, but I mean, he's, I'll remember his interview for the rest of my life, you know, and, and those are the kind of people I surf to meet 
because they have what I call, I always say this, they have salt. They are, have a grit about them that um, they have, they exemplify the human experience. You know, it makes me feel like I'm closer towards why we're here on planet earth, talking to them, you know? And um, those are the people that really, uh, when I think about the corridors of guests that I had, he's one of them and people with those kind of struggles, you know, um, uh, yeah, I've had somebody on the show where they were, they're the author of a book called the unlucky sperm club, where his mom was raped by a police officer and his mom's dad killed the police officer, spent life in jail. And his, he, it, he's the son of the dead police officer and the grandfather who spent life in jail. And I said, you know, that's, you know, but this guy is the most wonderful person because iron sharpens iron, mm -hmm. you know? So those are the, those kind of guests and anybody speaking, you know, that's why I'm here. I do other podcasts because I'm just interested in finding other real people that don't have to be movie stars. I mean, or, or rock stars or anything. I just want real people that have overcome large obstacles, find success. Cause those are the people that, you know, it's hard to find, you know, we know about every star it's ever had, but these people, there's beautiful diamonds in the rough out there. Great people that they don't know. People don't know their stories and they're just wonderful people because all the hardships, you know, and they found that success because they figured a way to get out of that living shit in hell, you know, and I just I kind of love those people. So yeah, that's, that's as far as what I think about my guests. Well, you know, I, I have people that, you know, are musicians, actors, things like that, and they're wonderful people. And some of them have some great stories to tell, but I find that a lot of my best interviews are those people that may be behind the scenes or just somebody that's, been through something that they can they can share that story and hopefully change somebody else's life right uh, like you uh, i had dr david tenenbaum on my show and here's a guy that was uh, basically recruited by the the military to be a ambassador of sorts to uh israel because he spoke hebrew and ends up being accused of of treason and the, the hell that man went through and still to this day even though he won the case he's basically blacklisted from going anywhere else so he's kind of mm. stuck in his job but the, the he's a wonderful man and then there's those that you know have been through like being molested or abused you know down and out and you know overcoming just obstacles some people would just give up on on life about right Th those are the stories that i love to hear um, you know, i've got some friends that are in the business and i tell them hey it's great you're gonna if i interview such and such actor but how about the camera guy or, or the, mm. the boom mic guy you know i'm sure they've got some great stories to tell too <laughs> right. they don't have to be a a, a big name to have a great right. story right right absolutely you know and then i, I you know the 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 actors and the, those stars they're people too you know right but oh, yeah. uh, you know it's uh but those beautiful diamonds in the rough when you you're like you don't know about their story because they're not a public figure so then you discover that and sometimes i get discovered in real time right you know and uh i got somebody right now that the interview that i have after this uh he, uh, Chuman Han Bowen, he's an Indian. He's, he's been molested twice. He's been, uh, you know, left, you know, uh, homeless as a child, uh, just a tour de France of hell. And he's become a lawyer, a, a defendant, defending lawyer. Um, and he's, he's, he's got the, the braids, you know, the Indian braids. And he goes in there with his braids and his suit. And he's just a fascinating, and he's a cool dude. And he, he's not older, he's a younger guy, you know, and he's just, just a fascinating figure. And I was like, He's not a star, you know, but it's like, wow, this guy, I'm so excited to interview him today because like he's his story is so unique, you know, and what he's doing now. So I've said over and over again, when people look at, uh, you know, the, my, my videos, give these people a chance. Okay. Just because you've never heard of them doesn't mean that they don't have something to say. Right. You know, it's, it's great. I've, I've had Rudy Sarzo on my show and I'm mm. pretty sure you're familiar with Rudy Sarzo, bass player from quiet riot and mm -hmm. ozzy and white snake and and um he 
is fascinating because he was part of that. But then you listen to his story of his family coming here from Cuba and mm. the things that they had to go through in order to become American citizens. Those, right. are, those are great stories. And, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm very blessed to have had him on the show. But then I've got these other people that you probably never heard of in your life. Right. But, oh, my God, they've got some stories. Just give them a chance. That's what I say. Absolutely. So real quick, um, tell me about your experiences playing Dirk Diggler and then being in Boogie Nights. Uh, well, uh, the writer and director and producer of Boogie Nights, uh, when he was uh, 17 years old, uh, he and I had the same, his girlfriend, my girlfriend were sisters. He asked me to drive him home one night and we became best friends ever you know, since then, uh, you know, we, we don't really talk much now, but, but we were best friends for 12 years, long story, but I had him rolling one night and, uh, two days later he calls me up and says, look, man, I, I want you to be in this short film. I got an idea for called the dirt diggler story. It's about the rise and fall of a porno star named dirt diggler. And I said, all right, I'm in, you know, cause I wanted to, you know, I just wanted to be an actor, you know, and a couple months later we did a couple other funny videos and some other things. And, uh, then, you know, we're, did the Dirt Diggler story and he did well with it right away. He, he won an American Film Institute award for this video. It was a video film, you know, and um, it was half hour long, kind of like a spinal tap kind of thing. Yeah. And then uh, he did uh, his first, uh, he did a, a live action short after that called Cigarettes and Coffee. And then he did his first feature named Heart Eight. And right around that time is when he got to sell the screenplay of Boogie Nights, uh, New Line Cinema. And uh, I just really never saw anybody that I knew had nothing also, you know, I mean, he came from a wealthy family, but you know, he was, he started, he did everything on his own. It was self-made, you know, nobody makes these movies for you. And you have to really, you have to get right something great. You have to do something great. And to see that happen, that really changed my outlook on like, cause I felt no one ever gets a shot. You know, I spent three days with Brad Pitt as an extra and he was an extra on lesson zero in 1987. And I was like, these poor guys come out from the Midwest, never make it. You know, and I, and I, cause I really like this guy. And then like several movies later, I was like, holy shit, this guy hung out with him for three days, Brad. You know, and I, so seeing Paul do what he did, you know, made me believe, you know, this is possible, you know? And so that's what encouraged me to go off and do what I did. And I, and I had to choose, you know, eventually I was very close, you know, but I, how long do I want to try to go for this? And I reached that point where, you know, I made my films and I did well, but I, I was never really able to turn it over to a massive career. So I chose between there's passion and opportunity. So I chose opportunity. And I, to this day, you know, I, I still, I, I'm going to, I'm entering as my kids get older, I have more, a little bit more time. For, I still do my business. I started this podcast in March, starting to do stand up again. And now we're, I'm also doing a documentary. I might segue back into, you know, filmmaking and acting uh, next year. And, um, you know, keep that journey alive and nothing's changed for me. You know, I still just want to be an entrepreneur an actor and a stand-up comedian, you know, and I'll probably want to do that till the day I die. So that, uh, working on those things just made me realize the possibility of what, what you can do and what's what things can happen. As long as time plus effort, you know, eventually it'll give you the best chance for success. So that's what I learned from that. Do you have to show your schlong? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, you know, the uh it's funny you know when you go to like parties or something and somebody might say hey you know mike's the original dirt diggler i'm like you know that was a fictional short film and and you got to preface that to people on what you're talking about because they'll look at my crotch and i'll be like my wife will be shaking her head like no no <laughs> <laughs> i'll be like yeah no that's and like oh okay because I, I didn't because you know some people don't know what the dirt diggler story is. a lot of people know what boogie nights are but they don't know what the dirt diggler story is. I'm like, it's no, no, it's just a, it's a lot. It's a live action comedy short, you know, documentary style film. That was the short film version of Boogie Nights. You know, and we stuffed the underwear. If you know what I mean? <laughs> I was not gifted like a dirt diggler. You do like on spinal tap and wrap it in a, a cucumber, stuff it in your pants. <laughs> I, you know, I think we used a tissue or something, you know, I, I did, you know, although there's a shot where <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm in a jacuzzi and Paul like you know thought it would be funny to zoom in when I wouldn't have anything that was like on a winter day and I was like why'd you do that 
<laughs> Why'd you do that, man? Oh, He's just got a funny sense of humor. He was Paul, Paul Anderson, funny, Paul Thomas Anderson's a funny guy. People don't know that. That's, that's the best thing about him. He's, uh, he's gifted as a filmmaker, but he's also, he's, his sense of humor is just amazing. Well, uh, do you have like a website or, uh, you know, some social media that people can follow and also the name of your podcast? Yes. If you want to, you know, just go to longshotleaders.com. You can see all my social stuff there. And the main reason is that, you know, if you have a long shot story, if anybody, you know, has overcome large obstacles to find success, just go to the contact page and pull it down there and, and let us know what your long shot story is. And uh, we'd like to have you on the show. So yeah, just go to longshotleaders.com and you can find out more about me and uh, what I do. Sweet. Well, I uh, look forward to maybe collaborating with you in the future and and um we're not too far from each other so maybe we can get together and hang out sometime that's right kyle yates for all intents and purposes we are austinites together aren't we yeah i i went south though i was living up north and i went south because I, I told you i used to live there in leander cedar park area and and now well since they named the town after me i figure i guess i'd live there Kyle, yeah. Well, you know, I'm a Valley boy from Los Angeles, you know, so I lived in the San Fernando Valley, which is about 25 minutes north of Hollywood and big city. And that's what I did today out here in, um, in, you know, Austin. I live 25 minutes north in Georgetown, Texas, which is like the Valley version, the Calabasas version, I guess, of Austin. And I'm just used to my, that's close to my natural habitat. It's an awesome little town. If you're ever in the Austin area, go check out Georgetown. It's I love that place. We used to love to go there. And uh, there's a lot of really cool places that are near and dear. I mean, near uh, around the Austin area. It's just, it, it's beautiful. You get to see the hills and there's so much nature. I uh, love hanging out by the river and, of course, mm -hmm. Lake Travis and all those. It's just, it, that's why we moved here. It's fun, isn't it? Yeah, it's good. That it is. But unfortunately, our time has come to an end. And so I want to thank you for being on the show. I appreciate your time. I, we kind of had to jump through some hoops to get here, but we made it. <laughs> yes. Our second time around. But, you know, this was good. I, I'm, I, uh, you're a pleasure. You know, you're the kind of guy, you know, you, you almost may feel, feel like, you know, uh, this is the kind of guy you want to just, you know, pick a guitar with, have a beer with, and just kind of hang out and just talk and and uh, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. And um, unfortunately, no beer for me, but I will take some Whataburger tea. There you go. Whataburger tea. Yeah. Oh, and a Whataburger. <laughs> That's right, man. First thing on, I got out of surgery the other day. Take me to Whataburger. I haven't eaten for, you know, was it 16 hours? It's time to get something good. Oh, so good. <laughs> all right. Have fun. All right, man. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. If this is your first time catching the show, we're glad that you joined us. If you've been listening to the show and a subscriber, we appreciate you as well. And please come back. We're going to have some other wonderful guests, just like Mr. Stein here. And until the next one, peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts and on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network.